You already know what's up. This your girl Up, and welcome back to another video by no other than Mr. Baller. Come on. I know you've seen this coming. Today's video was called His Family Never Saw It Coming. Now, just based off the title, I know it was going to be going to be a lot of odd events transpiring during this story. It's, it's, it, it, I got to brace myself for this because these type of stories, you never know what the outcome may be. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. We're about to find out. Without further ado, let's just get right into this video, okay? Today's story covers one of the strangest and most hotly debated mysteries on the internet. But before we get into today's really? story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, pretty sure I didn't hear you come about to the right story. place because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to help the like button pack up all their things so they can move, but only use old and weak tape so the bottom of the moving boxes fall out as soon as anyone tries to lift them. Also, please subscribe to oh, our that's channel cold. and turn on all that's notifications cold. so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. This guy is amazing. Oh my God, yo. Oh my God. In mid-August 2013, Mike and Karen Las Pisa helped their beloved only child, 19-year-old Bryce Las Pisa, get all of his things packed up and into the family car. Bryce had just spent the summer with his parents in their home in Laguna Niguel, California, which is one of the nicest places to live in the entire country. But now that the summer was coming to an end, it was time for Bryce to head back to Sierra College in Rockland, California, where he was set to start his sophomore year. Once all of his things were packed inside the trunk of the car, all three of them hopped inside and then made the seven hour drive north to his campus. Once his parents had moved him into his apartment, they gave him a hug and a kiss and wished him luck, and then they left. On their ride back home, Mike and Karen talked about how well their son seemed to be doing. He loved his school, he loved the program he was in, he was in graphic design, he was a very gifted artist, he had lots of friends, he had a wonderful girlfriend. It just seemed like he was living his best life and he was on the path to success. So oh, they nothing cute could prepare together. them for what their son did two weeks later. Just a couple of days after getting dropped off at school, uh -oh. Bryce's very close friend and roommate, Sean, and Bryce's girlfriend, Kim, noticed Bryce was acting erratically. Specifically, he was drinking a ton of hard alcohol. Now, Bryce was no saint. He liked to drink and party like many other kids his age did, but the amount of alcohol he was consuming was concerning. Also, Bryce began experimenting with a drug called Vyvanse, which is a very powerful stimulant that's normally used to treat attention deficit disorder. Now, Bryce didn't have mm. attention deficit disorder. He was taking it in order to stay up late at night and play video games. But between the heavy drinking and the drug use, it seemed like Bryce's personality was starting to change. He was becoming anxious and skittish and kind of paranoid. And so finally, Sean and Kim confronted him about his substance. Maybe he started becoming that way because of you know the medicine the stuff he was taking you know maybe that was the side effects you know what i'm saying so and he was consuming alcohol on top of that so you know what i'm saying it's this is I feel like this is going to go bad already. Abuse and asked him, you know, like, what's going on? What's causing you to act this way? And Bryce would say, nothing, guys. I'm fine. I'm just, you know, drinking and doing whatever I want to do. It's not a big deal. But Sean and Kim, they weren't buying it. They were convinced that something bad had happened to Bryce. And the way he was coping with it was by drinking really heavily and taking this drug. On August 28th, so about two weeks after Bryce has been dropped back off at school by his parents, Bryce and his roommate Excuse Sean were alone in their apartment together. And at some point as they're sitting there just kind of minding their own business Bryce says to Sean hey I want to give you something and he takes his diamond earrings out and he gives them to Sean and Sean's looking at these earrings and he's like you know didn't your mom give these to you aren't these important to you these are expensive and Bryce just says no I want you to have them and so Sean is looking at these earrings looking back at Bryce wondering what's going on here and then before he can even refuse the gift Bryce is grabbing his Xbox and putting it on the table and telling Sean I want you to have this too take my Xbox and so Sean is like, I can't accept these two things. These That's are expensive. A, these are valuable to you. Red you know, flag. 
flag, man. What's going on here? But Red Bryce flag. would just say, look, man, I, I want you to have these things. You're important to me and I want to give these to you. And so as Sean is sitting there wondering how to handle this very strange offering, he watched Bryce pull his phone out and begin really aggressively texting somebody. And then after a while, Bryce looks up from his phone and he tells Sean, hey, just so Ooh, you know, sorry. I broke up with Kim. At this point, Sean knows, okay, something is definitely wrong here. There's no reason Bryce would break up with Kim. They were such a loving couple. They doted on each other. They were very close. They had just seen each other earlier in the day. Nothing seemed to be wrong. And so now Bryce is text breaking up with her. It didn't make any sense. Plus, Bryce is now trying to give him all these valuable things. It just wasn't really adding up. Yeah. So Sean decided he needed to get in touch with Bryce's parents because clearly someone needed to intervene. Yeah, and so Sean smart, waited smart. until Bryce left. Bryce actually left to go talk to Kim. And at that point, Sean got his phone out and he looked up Bryce's parents and he called them. Bryce's mother, Karen, she picks up the phone and Sean explains that, you know, your son, he's acting strangely. He's abusing drugs and alcohol. And I wouldn't be doing this unless I thought there was a problem. Like, I'm not trying to get him in trouble. I want you to reach out to him and see what's going on because I think there's a problem. And so Karen was alarmed by this. She had no idea any of this was going on. And she says, okay, you know, I'll reach out to my son. Thank you for telling me. And so they hang up. And before Karen can even call Bryce, Bryce is calling her. And so Karen answers the phone, but it's not Bryce. It's Kim, his now ex-girlfriend. And she says to Karen, hey, I'm sorry to just call you like this, but your son, he just showed up at my apartment and he's acting so strangely that I actually took his keys. I don't want him to drive. There's something wrong with him. It's hard to describe, but he just seems totally off. And so now Karen's really concerned because just seconds ago, Sean has told her basically the same, same thing. Yeah. So Karen asks Kim, will you please put my son on the phone? Bryce picks up the phone and he says, hey, mom, and he sounds totally normal. And she asks him, you know, what's going on? I keep hearing that you're acting strangely. And, you know, what are you doing over at Kim's apartment? What's going on here? And Bryce would tell his mom that, look, mom, I just broke up with Kim. It's a very messy breakup. That's why she's calling you. She's upset. And, you know, that's why I'm over here. We're talking about it. And look, at this point, I just really want to go home. I want to go back to my apartment, but she has my keys. Can you please tell her to give me my car keys back so I can leave? But Karen wasn't really buying it. She knew her son really well, and it just seemed totally strange that two of his very close friends in his inner circle would say the same thing independent of one another. And so she says, you know what, Bryce, look, I want you to just stay there and I'm going to fly out there first thing tomorrow morning and I'm going to just see what's going on out there. And at this, Bryce immediately says, no, mom, I have a lot to talk to you about. And until I talk to you about it, I don't want you coming out here. And so Karen's like, what do you mean you have a lot to talk to me about? What is it that you have to talk to me about? I, I don't really understand. But Bryce refused to elaborate over the phone, which Karen thought was very odd because mm -hmm. Bryce was remarkably forthcoming with his parents. They had a very open relationship. They were very honest with each other. So for him to not even even give a hint at whatever it was that was on his mind that in some way had to do with what was going on here, it just seemed very odd and unnecessarily cryptic. Yeah. And so Karen gave mm -hmm. up trying to get more information out of her son, and instead oh. she put her husband on the phone. And he asked Bryce, hey, you know, what's going on here? Are you okay? And your mom tells me there's some problem. Like, what's going on here? And Bryce, again, just reiterates, look, Dad, I just broke up with my girlfriend. That's all that's going on here. There's no need to be concerned. I just need one of you to tell Kim to give me my keys back so I can go back to my apartment. That's all I need right now. And so Mike felt convinced that his son was totally fine, even though it did seem odd that two of his friends had said he was acting erratically. Yeah. But from Mike's perspective, Bryce seemed just fine. And so he said as much to Karen and thought, you know, let's just get Kim to give him his keys back and he can go back to his apartment and we can talk to him later about whatever it is that's going on. And so reluctantly, Karen gets back on the phone and she asks to speak with Kim and she says, hey, Kim, would you mind giving our son his keys back? He'd like to leave. And so Kim says, OK, I'll give him his keys. And then they hung up and then Kim got the keys out. She gave him to Bryce and Bryce left. At about 11.30 p.m. that night, Bryce was in his car. He was getting ready to leave when his mom called him back and said, okay, look, I want you to go home, but as soon as you get there, just give me a call so I know you're safe. And Bryce said, no problem, I'll give you a call. About an hour and a half later at 1 a.m., Bryce called his mom back to let her know that he was home safe at his apartment and Karen and Mike are totally relieved and they tell their son, okay, you know, we'll talk to you tomorrow morning. 10 hours later at 11 a.m. on August 29th, Karen received an automated phone call from her car insurance company, letting her know that roadside assistance had been used on their 2003 Toyota Highlander car. 
that was Bryce's car. And so Karen's totally confused because the last she spoke to her son, he was at his apartment. He was home safe. He did not Whoa, have any car God. problems. And so she's thinking, you know, did he get up early this morning and get into an accident and call roadside assistance? Or maybe last night he got into car problems and just didn't tell her about it, but they were minor. And so she calls Bryce, but Bryce doesn't pick up. And so she dials his roommate, Sean. Sean does answer the phone and she says, hey, would you mind putting Bryce on the line? But Sean says, Bryce isn't here and he didn't come home last night. Considering the general weirdness around their son's recent behavior, this really shocked Karen and Mike. At first they thought we need to call the police because something horrible has happened. But then they thought, well, wait a minute, let's go into his bank statements because he has a credit card that we gave him and let's see if there's any recent purchases that will allow us to track where he is. And so they pull up his bank statements and his most recent. That's a good idea, but you still could have called the cops. One of you could have called the cops and one of you could have checked for the recent transactions from, you know, the credit card. Both of y'all could have did it. Why hold off? Why? Why not contact the cops? Why? Why not? Why not? This is, you know what? charge was only a few hours earlier and it was at a car repair shop in Button Willow, California, which is the small desert town right off of the I-5 highway located about halfway between his school campus and their hometown in Laguna Niguel. And so Karen and Mike assume their son last night must not have gone to his apartment, but instead just kept on driving south in an attempt to drive all the way back home to his hometown of Laguna Niguel. I mean, after all, he did tell his mom he had a lot to talk about and he didn't want to talk about it on the phone and so they assumed he must be driving here to talk about whatever it was in person and perhaps he ran into some car problems in button willow california that's why he pulled over that's why there's this charge at this auto repair shop and so karen calls the auto repair shop in button willow and a man who worked there named christian answered the phone and so karen asked him you know have you seen my son he's got red hair he's got a tattoo on his arm he's driving a 2003 toyota highlander and christian says oh yeah yeah we saw him a couple of hours ago we responded to his roadside assistance call. He ran out of gas on the I-5 highway. He pulled into a rest stop and we drove to that rest stop and we gave him gas. And so Karen asked Christian, you know, did my son indicate where he was going next? And Christian said, no, he didn't. We just gave him the gas and then we left. But if you'd like, I'd be more than happy to just drive over to the rest stop. It's only about 15 minutes away and see if he's still there. It's unlikely because it's been a couple of hours, but you know, maybe. And Karen and Mike are like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Would you do that? That would be great. And so Christian hops That's in the car amazing. and he drives the 15 minutes over to this rest stop. And he's not really expecting to see Bryce in this parking lot. It had been almost three hours, but he pulls into the lot and there is the 2003 Toyota Highlander with Bryce sitting inside of it. He's just sitting behind the wheel, staring out into nothingness. And so Christian walks up to the driver's side and he looks down to get Bryce's attention. And Bryce kind of snaps out of it and looks up and he's surprised to see Christian again. He rolls the window down and Christian says to him, hey, I just talked to your parents. They're really concerned about you. You got to talk to them. And so Christian actually pulls out his phone and he calls Karen and says, hey, he is still here. Here he is. And he hands the phone to Bryce. And as soon as Bryce puts the phone to his ear and he says, hello, Karen's like, what are you doing? What are you doing just sitting in this rest stop in the middle of Button Willow, California? We're so worried about you. And Bryce didn't really have an answer. He just kept telling his mom, oh, I'm not doing anything. I'm just, I'm just sitting here. And so finally his mom stops trying to get information from him and just says, look, please just fill your car up with gas and come straight home, please. And Bryce says, okay, yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll do that right now. And so Bryce hands the phone back to Christian. Christian pulls it up to his ear and he says, hey, Karen. That, what happened the night before was enough for y'all to get your asses up and go to where he was. Okay, first of all, that uh, that situation going down, I don't even see how y'all was able to sleep, okay? It's not like y'all in a different state. Y'all in the same state, just hours away. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
All right, it looks like he's leaving now, so I'm gonna take off. Karen thanks him and they hang up. Christian goes back into his car. He leaves the lot and as he's driving, he looks over at Bryce and it didn't really look like Bryce was getting ready to leave. It looked like he had just gone back to sitting and blankly staring out of his car. But Christian figured, you know what? He just talked to his mom. He said he was gonna go home. I'm sure that's what he's gonna do. The drive from Button Willow, California, south to Laguna Niguel, California, where Bryce's parents were, was about a three hour trip. And so the Los Pisos were expecting their son to arrive around 3 p.m. By 3.30 p.m., when he still hadn't shown up and he still hadn't called, Karen began calling her son, but he wasn't answering the phone. And as much as Karen and Mike wanted to believe their son had just gotten stuck in traffic or something like that, they knew deep down something was wrong. Something was okay, off Okay, his- so why are you still home? Why are you still home? Why are you home and why didn't you get in your goddamn car and drive to go see where he, what was going on? Like, are you, are you kidding me right now? You know, bruh, look, this, this is, this is what gets me angry. And I don't like blaming people, but somebody has to take some accountability for things like this. If I know my child, especially if my child lied about being somewhere, you know what I'm saying? About coming home and they, they, they're not home. You know what I'm saying? Then they they had some type of trouble in the middle of the night and all this stuff. Oh, are, you, are you serious right now? My black ass would have been on the next flight. Matter of fact, I wouldn't even be on a flight. I'd be in my car. It's two hours. It's three hours away. That three hour trip would have turned to a, a fucking hour trip. I'm telling you, yo. I wouldn't even have washed my ass. I wouldn't even have did my hair. I wouldn't have brushed my teeth. The moment I kept calling him, I would have been already on the road, straight up. Like, yeah, this is already pissing me off. This story is, this shit is pissing me off. It's really making me mad. Let me... Let me brace myself because I know I'm going to get... For the next several hours, they continuously tried calling their son and he never answered the phone. And so finally, by 6 p.m. that night, when he still hadn't shown up and they still couldn't get in touch with him, they called the police and they filed an official missing person report. Should have been did that! their search by contacting Bryce's cell phone provider, AT&T, and they asked them to use their cell phone towers to ping Bryce's cell phone, basically triangulate where his phone is located. And once they did that and they had the actual location of his phone, the police and Bryce's parents were shocked at where it was. It was still in Button Willow, California. It was located just a couple of miles down the road from that rest stop where Christian had last seen Bryce. It was now in this parking lot of this hotel. And so the police around <laughs> Button Willow were alerted oh, to the fact that Bryce was a missing person and his phone was apparently in this parking lot. And so police were sent over there to see if Bryce was there too. And so the police arrive in this hotel parking lot and sure enough, right in the middle is the 2003 Toyota Highlander with Bryce sitting behind the wheel, just sitting there staring out the front. And so an officer walks up and he knocks on the glass and Bryce rolls the window down. And the officer would say Bryce acted totally normally. He was friendly, he was lucid, he answered all their questions. When he got out of the car and they conducted field sobriety tests, he passed all of them. He even said, hey, if you want to search my car, go for it. I'm not doing anything out here. And so the officers did search his car and there were no drugs, no alcohol. There was nothing suspicious in his car. And when they asked him, you know, what are you doing out here? Your parents are so concerned about you. Bryce would tell them that he was just sitting there. He didn't really have much of an answer, but he told them he planned on going home soon. And so one of the officers said to him, hey, you really need to call your mom. You need to call home and let them know that you're okay. And when they told him to do that, Bryce suddenly became really apprehensive, like he did not want to call home. And the officer picked up on it and he said, hey, you got to tell your family what's going on. They're the reason we're out here. They're concerned about you. So get out your phone and dial your mom. And so Bryce reluctantly pulled his phone out. He dialed his mother's number and he hit call. And the officer said, give me the phone. So Bryce hands over the phone. The officer picks it up. Karen answers the phone and the officer tells her, hey, look, I'm with your son. He's just fine. He's sober. There's no drugs. There's no alcohol. 
I don't really know what he's doing, but he says he's gonna go home pretty soon, but there's nothing wrong about the situation that I can tell. You need to talk to your son and figure out what's going on. And so he hands the phone over to Bryce. Bryce picks it up and Karen says to him, what's going on? Why are you still in Buttonwillow? It's been like nine hours. And Bryce really didn't give her an answer to any of her questions. He just kind of deflected all of them and said he'd be home soon and don't worry about it. I'm just sitting here. There's nothing to worry about. And so finally, Karen just stopped trying to pull information out of her son. She could tell that again, he was not gonna tell her what's going on. And so she changed her tactic and she told her son very gently, Bryce, please just go get a bite to eat, get a cup of coffee, kind of get yourself together here, yes. and then please just drive home. It's only a few hours away. Bruh, drive home. Fuck food, bruh. Fuck food, okay? Why are you? Oh, y'all are still home. Y'all had nine hours. Nine hours. He's still, he's still alive and well nine hours seriously and it, he's only two and a half hours away from y'all if you want to estimate it i'll say three like mr baller said three y'all had nine hours alive and well and y'all still didn't leave the fucking house to go and get y'all kid bro you know what and we can talk about whatever problems you have, but you just got to drive home. You got to leave Button Willow. You got to come home. And Why at this, are you says pressing to mom, him to go you know home? Okay, Why won't you sorry, go to him? And so they hang up and the officer who was kind of oh. eavesdropping intentionally on this conversation to make sure everything was fine, the officer was satisfied that everything was fine, that Bryce was sober, that he would head home. And so he says, okay, Bryce, you know, best of luck, head home to your parents. And the officer left. An hour later, Karen received a call from Christian, the car repairman who had checked on Bryce earlier. And he was actually returning one of Karen's calls. She'd called him sometime and he didn't get back to her. And so he was calling back and he wanted to know, you know, had Bryce made it home safely? Because now it's been several hours from when he saw him last. And Karen would tell Christian, actually, no, after you left, my son did not leave Buttonwillow. He just went down the road to a parking lot. But, you know, the police actually were just over there that checked on him. And now I'm certain he's making his way home. Christian, who felt kind of invested in what was happening with Bryce, would say to Karen, hey, I don't mind driving over there and just confirming he has left this parking lot. But Karen would say, you know what? I'm confident he's on his way. Don't worry about it. You're too kind. So they hang up. And afterwards, Christian, even though he didn't have to, Bruh. he decided. Christian, yo, you need the, the, the city, the state, the mayor, the governor need to give you a gold medal or the key to the city or something, yo, because you try so hard to make sure that that boy was okay. See, people like that restores my faith in humanity. It's good people out there. You know what I'm saying? And it's amazing how this this situation has nothing to do with him, but he still involved himself in it because he wants to help. That guy deserves money, hug, lots of love, the key to the city, the key to the state, whatever. That he's a real one. He's a real one, yo. I I wish I could hug him. over there and make sure Bryce really has left because obviously something strange is going on here. And, you know, if there is some problem, maybe I can assist. And so he drives over to this hotel parking lot and he really was not expecting to see Bryce there. But he pulls into the lot and who's still in the middle of the lot but Bryce in his 2003 Toyota Highlander just staring out the front of his car. And so this time Christian pulls up right next to him, he parks the car, he walks right up to the window and he's a little bit more forceful, friendly, but forceful with Bryce. He has him roll the window down and Bryce obviously is very surprised to see Christian again. It's the third time he's seen this car repairman and Christian says to him, hey, Bryce, you need to go home. Your parents are so worried about you. You need to leave right now. In fact, I'm gonna watch you leave and then I'm gonna follow you onto the highway to make sure you're going home. And so Bryce was a little bit taken aback at how forceful he was being, but he would ultimately say, okay, yeah, all right, let's leave. And so Christian gets back in his car and he goes right behind Bryce. And after a few seconds, Bryce pulls out of the lot and he starts driving onto the road and Christian follows him. And for the next hour, Christian would just remain behind Bryce and watch him drive towards Laguna Niguel. 
And while he was driving, Christian would actually call Karen and Mike back. And he would say to them that, you know, your son had not left, but now he's good. He's on the highway. I'm right behind him. He'll be home soon. And so when Christian and Bryce made it to the last leg on the way to the Good Miguel, job. Christian was confident that Bryce was fine and he would get home under his own steam. He wasn't driving erratically. Everything seemed normal. And so Christian pulled up alongside Bryce. He kind of waved to him to say, you know, I'm leaving. And then he turned around oh, and he headed back to Buttonville. Oh, Shortly no. after this, Karen called Bryce. Bryce picked up the phone. He's still driving. And Karen tells him, okay, you're going to give me landmarks of the things you're seeing as you're driving so that I know you're actually driving home. But Bryce refused to give them to her. He would say, oh, I, I can't see anything out my window. It's too dark and oh, I don't know where anything Christian. is. And so despite Karen and Mike getting so frustrated with him saying, come on, tell us something. Give us a sign, a road sign, anything. Tell us anything around you. Bryce didn't give them any information. And so finally at about 2 a.m. when Bryce really should have been in Laguna Niguel or very close, he tells his parents over the phone that he's too tired to continue and he needs to pull over and take a nap. At first, his parents urged him to just keep on going. Come home. You can sleep as long as you want when you get here. But as they were saying it, they realized their son had been awake for nearly 24 hours at this point, And it's the middle of the night. So it does kind of make sense for him to pull over and take a nap. And so they say, OK, pull over. But as soon as you wake up, you need to call us so we know you're back on the road. So Bryce says, no problem. I'll do that and they hang up. Several hours later at 8 a.m., Karen and Mike have still not heard from their son and they're telling themselves that he's probably just sleeping, he's totally exhausted, I'm sure he's fine. And then they hear their doorbell ring and they're immediately so relieved because they're thinking, Bryce is here, he's finally arrived, thank goodness. They run to the door, they open it up and it's not Bryce, it's a police officer. And the officer asked them, do you own a 2003 Toyota Highlander car? Oh my God, so I'm done, I'm done. They say, yes, our son Bryce drives that car. The officer I'm told done. them that the car had been located a few hours earlier at the bottom of a 25 foot cliff near Castaic Lake. Oh Castaic my Lake God. Castaic Lake is like halfway between Button Willow and Laguna Niguel. They told the parents that there was no sign of a driver. Bryce was not there. They did find two small drops of blood inside the vehicle, but the Beyond that, there was no indication that Bryce had sustained life-threatening injuries from this crash. They said the back window of the vehicle had been broken from the inside, indicating that Bryce had escaped the wreck by punching out that window. His laptop and phone were still in the vehicle, and his wallet and duffel bag were outside the vehicle on the road and looked like they had been rummaged through before they were left there. After an examination of the damage to the car, the final tire tracks that led down to where it had been found, and traffic cameras in the area, it was concluded that Bryce had actually intentionally driven off this cliff and he had actually hit the accelerator right before he went over the edge. After Mike and Karen headed out to the crash scene and had a chance to talk to some of the investigators that had been looking for Bryce, they informed the parents that most likely what they were looking at with this crash was a failed suicide attempt. But Mike and Karen, they just couldn't buy that. That was not like their son. And just two weeks earlier when they dropped him off, he was happy, he was excited to be at school, he was talking about the future, he was not someone that was suicidal. And so what situation could he have possibly gotten himself into in just those two weeks that was so bad it would lead to something like this? It made investigators and the parents wonder, you know, was Bryce hiding something? What did he mean when he said he had a lot to talk about? Did that have something to do with this thing he was hiding? A huge search was launched in and around the area where the car had been found with hundreds of people on horseback, on ATV, on foot. There were helicopters in the air. They put divers in the lake. I mean, they looked everywhere for days and days and days but oh, nothing was found on the ninth day of the search they brought a bloodhound out to see if it could pick up bryce's scent and sure enough it did right at the crash site and the dog followed the scent all the way down to the lake it walked around the lake to this bridge it was actually a dam that went across the lake it followed his scent right across the bridge to the other side and then it kept on following it up this small access road until it reached a truck stop and then his scent just stopped and so police and the parents and everyone involved in this investigation was really surprised at this discovery and so police got another bloodhound a separate bloodhound they brought it out to see if it could do the same thing to prove that this really was his scent trail and sure enough the bloodhound picked up his scent it went down to the lake it went around to the bridge went over went to the truck stop and then it just stopped but after the scent trail was discovered there was no other leads for anyone to follow and so after three weeks of looking everywhere for Bryce the search was called off some say Bryce was suicidal 
suicidal. That's why he drove off the cliff. That was a suicide attempt. And despite the bloodhounds picking up his scent, Bryce was most likely in the lake somewhere. Others disagree and say Bryce is still alive. That after this crash, he gets out of the car and he walks down to the lake, he walks around to that bridge, he goes up to the truck stop, and then he hitches a ride with someone and vanishes, and now he's living off the grid somewhere. And still others believe Bryce's drug and alcohol use caused a psychotic break, and that was what was causing all this strange behavior, and that was what led him to drive off the cliff, and perhaps when he landed, he sustained a vicious head wound that caused him to forget who he was, and so now he's just kind of wandering around somewhere, not knowing who he is, or knowing that he's a missing person. As for his parents, they say he would never do this on purpose. He would never cause this much pain to the people that love him, and so he must have been a victim of foul play. But regardless of what you believe happened to Bryce, something not. happened to him, and it's probably connected to whatever it was he said he needed to talk to his mom about. That thing that he couldn't discuss on the phone that potentially he was trying to drive home to talk to his mom and dad in mm -hmm. person about. But unless we find Bryce and he's still alive, it's unlikely we'll ever know what it was. Since August 30th, 2013, when Bryce went missing, no one has heard from him and no one has seen him. If you think you have information about Bryceless Pisa, please call this number now. Let them know what you know because his parents, volunteers, the police, there's so many people still looking for him. And so any bit of information could crack this case. So please, if you have information, call this number below. So that's gonna do it guys. If you found the secret- I'm really, really trying not to cry right now because this could have been seriously prevented the pa i'm sorry somebody has to take the blame the parents did not try hard enough i'm sorry they didn't try they didn't try hard enough you telling me you drove seven how long seven or eight hours to take him to college or whatever but you couldn't drive three hours to where the tower the sick the, the cell phone tower picked up the signal from his cell phone like you know what? I'm I'm I they're gonna have they're gonna have this on their minds for the rest of their life. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person who's saying this and feel this feel. I'm sorry, feel the exact same way. The parents didn't try hard enough. Like you you you, you had 24, I would say 24 hours. Even nine hours is more than enough time. Y'all in the same state. Yeah, I was away from each other. Like, even if you didn't feel like driving, you should have hopped on the next flight and went to wherever he was. Like, this is this is crazy. This is another situation that could have been prevented, yo. And all y'all kept doing was calling him on the phone. Calling his phone. Calling his phone. You know what? I'm 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 done. That's it. That's it for me. Mm-mm. As always, thank you for watching me react to these creepy, mystery, paranormal, all these crazy videos. And hit that subscribe button for me so you can see more videos just like this one. Toodles!